being vulnerable requires courage because to act like you're tough and fine and to put off all your problems together, one day you're going to snap and that that's going to be weak and that's not going to be great. The hard stuff is to look inside yourself and go, this is going to be really difficult, but it's the truth. And to put it out there and to make yourself vulnerable, not only does it show that you are an incredibly strong person that's done this brave thing by confronting something that uncomfortable, but it makes you stronger because then you don't have that thing to be afraid of. So there is this fear-based perspective that all of humanity by default has that they're like, I'm not going to talk about it. Mm. I'm afraid to talk about these things. I shouldn't share this. I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to be judged by others when in reality, and I can say this as someone who's just felt it myself, it's the complete opposite. Yeah, that's big. I just think that that message right there is like maybe one of the most important ones because everybody's looking for relief, right? Everyone's yeah. looking for some relief, some joy, some uh, exhale, uh, some freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and so it's, it's in that vulnerability. They are so scared to go there. So it's like to, again, kind of like therapy to normalize the fact that right on the brink of that vulnerability, which I love, mm -hmm. I think it was Brene Brown that defined vulnerability as being th sharing, not sharing things, uh, that are like maybe something that people don't know, but sharing things that you're not sure you're ready to say, because otherwise you're just telling a story. So if you share, it's like that moment when you get ready to say or do something that's like, I don't know, those are, that's the one you like got to step right into because that's something that is actually a vulnerability because you're kind of not that's sure how it's going to go. Yeah. Otherwise you're just telling a story that you just maybe haven't told yet. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm great at. You know, my whole little, uh, comedy clown career was me going like, here's a bunch of stuff I want to talk about. Well, what about that thing you really don't want to talk about? Ooh, not yet. Mm -hmm. And yet when I got there, it happened. And as you said, with solo therapy, everyone I know and mental health conversations about it, it's, it's come a long way even in the last five, 10 years ago, because mm -hmm. the perception of it would be like, oh, you're on anti-anxiety medication, which is completely normal. It's completely fine. So many people are doing it. That's crazy pills or, oh no, this person's taking a mental health day. Ooh, they're having a breakdown. And it's like, that's, that's all misinformation. It's not true. We need to have this so much better educated and less toxic perspective on this universal experience of what we all have going on in our minds. And even when it comes to therapy, people think I'm not completely having a breakdown. My life isn't a complete mess. I don't think I'm this walking, talking, traumatized person. I don't need therapy. Every single human on earth needs therapy because when you talk and it, it doesn't, what it is when you're breaking it down is you're actually just being honest about your thinking and feeling with someone who's there to talk back to you. Like me in the YouTube comments, the people giving me that perspective. It's just mm -hmm. someone going like, okay, I'm going to tell you what you are and what's happening and saying. And you just have these profound realizations. And I don't want people to think mental health, books, podcasts, anything about it. It's not for me because I'm not at that place yet. It's we are all at that place all of the time. Yeah. You cannot see it as something to cure when you've already snapped. It's something that you need to prevent by knowing this stuff and keeping yourself healthy and happy yeah. and afloat the whole time. Yeah. So you're absolutely right with that. I, I would make it, if I was an evil dictator, that's actually not evil. I would just force every human on earth to have an hour of therapy a week. And that'd be like no more war. It would be great. I think you're actually right. Call it therapy, call it meditation. I don't give a crap what you call it, but like any same thing, couple yeah. of like mindful activities and things to face yourself. Like, cause again, the therapist is just showing you, you, uh, which is like, uh, traumatizing. Cause you're like, Oh, that's me. And then you're like, also like, <laughs> Oh, that's, oh, me. that's me. I mean, that's, <laughs> right. I mean, that's, uh, um, so what is the third part of the book about? It goes all into that hard stuff. So it's um, like, yeah. hey, therapy, um, yeah, it's going to be long. It's going to be hard. It may even be hard to access depending on <laughs> where you are in the world, how much money you have, this, that, and the other, because that's the whole thing. You know, medication, love it. For some people, it's a privilege that they can even be medicated to get them through a tough time. And it's that thing where here's the knowledge. you got to apply it to your own life. It's about looking in and trying to just analyze how do you see the world? What are the experiences that shaped you? How do you react to your own emotions? How do you react to other people? What do you expect from situations in the present and the future based on things that have happened to you in the past? And trying to recognize these things and go, actually, have I been taught lessons about how the world works because of something that happened to me as a child or even something recently? And therefore, I'm going forward with these expectations that are actually super destructive and holding me back in life. And this is the kind of stuff that 
it can take you years to just know who you are, to unpack something that may have come from a past trauma, which is why, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, do this when you're, when you're in the better place. And so much of it's just your mindset. If you think that you have this fixed mindset that you are built a certain way, you can't change, you expect certain things, that's what your life's going to be. It's going to be the same. If you go through life with a mindset trying to grow and challenge yourself and be open to new perspectives and experiences, then not only might you surprise yourself by what you find, but you can just have a completely different perception of failure and attempting something. And what's the point of doing anything at all? Mm -hmm. And that for me was one of those light bulb moments where I was like, yeah, okay, my mindset's pretty terrible. I kind of, I manifest negativity everywhere I go because I'm putting it in front of me like a carrot on a stick. If I reframe my thoughts, not to believe in sunshine and roses and that everything's always going to be fine. You can't be toxically positive by just saying, just believe and everything will be fine. You need to be realistic, but you need to be optimistic to give yourself hope and that positive momentum in order to see it. Because this is the most difficult thing for me as someone who's so cynical and has dealt with self-hatred. But if you practice self-gratitude, if you look around at the world and be thankful for the things that you have, if you allow yourself to be proud of yourself for the things that you're good at and the things that you do, that will actually make you better as a person, as a friend, in your career. And it's tough for me, you know, as this, as this British guy, I'm like, no, don't let the positivity in. Oh, it's going to make me weak. But actually <laughs> it's just the truth and it makes you more efficient. So you can struggle as much as you want, but realistic optimism, it's actually the best way to go. Well said. Are you, I know that at the beginning you were talking about your, you know, your, your humor being self-deprecating humor that is kind of like, hiding in plain sight, hiding issues in plain sight that you just don't really want to deal with. And you kind of, you know, you steal someone's ability to sort of go there because you called it out first, right? You kind of like, okay, can we go now? Um, Kind of thing to the issues. So is there, I'm curious, like you're writing a book and, and um, you know, is there a transition for you uh, with your career and the things that you do that you're really excited about that have come on the heels of, uh, you know, the, the work that you've done and the opportunities that you have now? And or is there some le- level of like, look, I have now disarmed all of the jokes because people know they're real or, you know, you know, like, or I've just healed so much. I don't have as much to self deprecate about. So maybe is there some kind of transition that's just happening, some kind of alchemy in your own being because of healing? 100% comedy and tragedy. It's that horseshoe curve where eventually their butts touch at the bottom (laughs) because really something's only funny because it's wrong and therefore there's a contrast and there's humor. And really every single joke, there's a butt of the joke. And for me, that was that was always myself. And it's, as I said, only, only because I am an entertainer, I'm putting things out there and I'd meet people after a show and they'd go, hey, you did that thing, here's my reflection of it. Did I realize there's, there's another step here? Because as much as I wanted to keep it professional and silly and just funny and not go to that deep dark place, someone would tell me whether you like it or not, that resonated it with me this way. So that's the power that you have. And really that's the power that all of us have to share our stories and to connect to other people. And as time went on, definitely, cause like the book, it's not a comedy book. It's a serious book about how to sort your life out. I am here as the guy that is writing it in a funny way, using myself as that, you know, punching bag. I'm like the mental health martyr. Anything that you think, I've, I've got a great example of how I wasn't doing that to say, yes, this will start the conversation by making you feel less weird. If I can make that joke to open the door, to break that barrier down for you, and then there's a truth behind, that's fine. You talk about healing. I'm not completely healed. I know what my problems are. And that's half of the journey. (laughs) Like, regardless of whether I I wrote the book, regardless of whether I've been on any journey, I I, I still need to to work on the issues. So I don't think I'm going to be completely strapped for comedy material for the rest of time. But... I think joking about these things is okay as an icebreaker to start the conversation and to most importantly, make people know that they're not alone in their experience 
Because if someone's joking about something, you're like, ah, oh, you can't joke about depression. Be serious. It's like, well, at least this person is acknowledging it and someone else is seeing an example of someone else going through that. Mm-hmm. What you can't do is just leave it at that. Once you've shone a light on something, you go, okay. <laughs> and now the hard part. Mm-hmm. Is that why you're writing the book? Do you feel oh yeah feel like a call? I mean, to sort of, or is it part of the therapy? I am writing the book because it's the thing that I wish I could have read 10 or 15 years ago. Cause I could have just written a book of funny stories about Dan's life <laughs> and that would have been easy for me. And it, it would, it would have been fun. It'd be a lot more self-indulgent, but I was like, no, actually I'm going to, I'm going to do this for myself in the present and I'm going to do it for all the people like me that I know are out there that maybe I can, they, they might not have to go through 10 years of questioning and suffering and just banging the head against the wall if we just put it all out there. So I hope that, you know, if I can give back in any way, you, you talk about what's going to make you feel proud in life. What makes you, what are you most proud of? And for me, it's that no matter what I like to self doubt about or think about the meaninglessness of the universe, even the lightest entertainment that I've ever done, if it's made someone just feel better or crack a smile on a really bad day, then that's like, Hey, I can't even deny that I've done something good. <laughs> and I need that. I, I need, I need irrefutable proof that no matter what, I, I, I cannot say no to it. And it's just, you know, at the end of the day, if all of this has been for something, sure. I'll allow myself to enjoy that feeling because there's no time for altruism here. Okay. When we're not doing good things and then trying to be all pious about it, go, no, if you're, if you're a good person, if you do good things, if you make the people in your life feel good and that makes you feel good, that's how things are supposed to be. That's it. I I was just, that was literally the last thing I was going to ask you what you're most proud of. Uh, and you just said it. So thank you. Thank you. You, um, your, uh, this will be a really big deal that you're taking, um, this time and opening yourself up more vul- in, into more vulnerability. Um, even if it's into just like a serious space instead of being funny. Right. I think there's some level of vulnerability of going, no, I'm mm-hmm. serious. I know you said, th- I'm serious. I could be right. Like there's like some I, aspect I'm, of like, ironically, I'm quite stressed and anxious about this book being out there. Cause there's so much of me in it. It feels <laughs> like I'm like, Oh, am I, am I, am I really about to put it this out there into the world? But I, you know, just have to remind myself of why and what it's for. So yeah, well done. hopefully it's a good idea. Thank you. Well done. Oh, um, uh, so have you been to the States very much? Uh, yeah, yeah, I go there for a well, you know, I used to. Now I don't really leave the house, but hopefully <laughs> we'll all be right. highly vaccinated soon. It's all going to be great. Right, right. Well, I li- I was I was just going to finish up. Like I lived in England for a few years, and I was going to oh, amazing. You know, ask what your favorite British meal is. I mean, my favorite British meal is a chicken tikka masala because the best British food is the food that the Indian population of the UK. Ooh. I mean, come on, we, we know we know what British food is. It's all very beige, and thankfully, uh, the multiculturalism has really helped us out a bit here. So, yeah, <laughs> that's true. I want to say thank you to the Italian family down the street. Thank you for the good food. <laughs> all right. Well, enjoy your tikka masala, and um, thank oh, you I so will. much, and congratulations, and um, keep um, keep facing yourself and we'll keep Mm -hmm. showing you who you are, which is like a super beautiful, vulnerable, wonderful, hilarious, witty British man. Well, thank you for saying that because I would literally never believe it. (laughs) Thank you for having me as well on something that's that's so inspiring. And the fact that you use your time to have all these conversations, Mm -hmm. it must really be so transformational for so many people. So I'm proud of you as well. Thank you. Thank you.